Ladies and gentlemen, I have an amazing video for you today. We will be taking a detailed look at the 20th game in the 1990 World Championship match between Garry Kasparov and Anatoly Karpov. But there is a twist. One of the most popular videos on YouTube is this one from GJ Chess, and it's a detailed analysis that Garry gives of his calculations toward the end of this game. I reached out to GJ Chess to show the footage in our video today, but I'm also going to show you the game from start to finish. Essentially, I'm going to be the Gary Kasparov Chess Translator for all of you, so let's get into it. So this is the fifth World Championship match between the two of these players in five years' time, and we have yet another Rui Lopez, with Bishop b5 on move 3 in the King's Pawn opening. Here Karpov plays a6, Bishop a4, Knight f6, castles by white, bishop e7. So far we are we are following what is known as the main line of theory. We have rook to e1, b5, bishop b3, d6, c3, castles, h3. Now if we just back up a few moves, say, let me slow it down, well there's one big question in all of these Rui Lopez's, where is black going to push this d pawn? Is black going to play d5 and enter the marshal, or is black going to play d6? And in this game, black plays d6, and we get c3, Castles, h3. At this point in time, black has a choice. Black can go back, playing the Briar system, play knight to a5 with c5, playing the Chigorin, or play something that Karpov played a lot, including against Kasparov, and something that was pretty popular at these times, bishop to b7. This is known as the Zaitsev system, and Zaitsev has a great last name, because it literally means rabbit, or bunny, for my Russians who are watching. Now, Pay very close attention to the next few moves. We are playing cutting edge theory as far as 1990 is concerned. We have d4, rook to e8, knight d2, bishop f8. So black activates the rook and drops the bishop back. Now black plays a prep, you know, preparation move, just stopping anything from coming to g5 in the future, while white is trying to instigate on the queen side. Bishop back to c2, and now black really wants to put this knight on b4, so they take and play knight b4, and white does not want this trade, so plays this strange looking move, bishop b1, but as crazy as this looks, and the fact that we're still on move 15 after the move c5, this has all been seen before, including by these two players just three years prior to this game. Now, to the uninitiated, the next few moves look very strange, but please bear with me, because the meat of the video is yet to come. Black plays the move knight back to d7, fighting for the dark square in the center, and wanting to advance this pawn and jump into c5, because then the two horsies are on the loose, and they're going to wreak havoc and try to get to d3. So now, again, to the uninitiated, this next move looks like it doesn't make any sense. The move is rook a3. Almost looks like a five-year-old who doesn't know how to develop their pieces, so they bring the rook up to bring it over. But there's a deeper idea involved. First of all, white wants to double up on the e-file, preparing for the later stage of the game, and that rook, if this knight were to move, would go even further and line up to the king. So there is a point behind this, and it has been seen in the past. Here black has a choice between c4 immediately and f5. Karpov plays the immediate lashing out f5. Now again, it looks like you're just losing a pawn, but you are destabilizing your center if you do that. And so for that reason, after f5, we just got the rook rotating over. This has all been seen. Still, we get knight to f6 by Karpov, knight h2, king h8, B3, take stakes, and you would think, okay, we're 21 moves in. Up until this moment, it's all been seen before, in the same year that this game was played, but now, after C4, we officially have a brand new game. Again, trying to use the pawn as a decoy to destabilize the center, but Gary finally activates the dark squared bishop, putting it on this diagonal. All right, now we have a very complex middle game. Karpov decides to take in the center, Gary recaptures, and now Karpov grabs the pawn, so he's taking the pawn. But at what cost? Well, White's bishops are very strong. But Karpov is definitely going to rely here on this move c3 to kind of block things or jumping in the way of the, of the bishop to try to get it to trade with that pawn. Gary finishes his plan of playing rook g3. Remember that plan from a long time ago? Karpov plays rook to e6. The point of this move is to stabilize things on the sixth rank and bring the queen maybe behind the rook. Now Gary plays knight to g4, activating that knight that he dropped back there a moment ago. That was the entire idea of playing the move knight h2 in the first place, to have rook coming here and this, and that's exactly what we see a few moves later. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin watching the footage of this amazing video. No, the move that Karpov was so unhappy with. Queen e8. He felt this was a critical error. 
So the intro to our entire clip of Kasparov calculating begins with the move Queen E8, which I did just mention was Karpov's idea. Karpov reinforces the rook along the E-file, disallowing Kasparov's knight from moving because the rook behind it will have no guard. At the same time, Karpov targets this pawn, potentially for the future, and fights for some sort of real estate of the light squares on the king side. But Karpov thought this move was a critical error because Gary now uncorks this. Knight takes h6. He, so he did not see this move? He didn't, I didn't calculate it. I, I, I knew that it should, it should won. He I saw can't... you playing very quickly this yeah, move I didn't over the board. Yeah, I it. I saw several lines. Why it's winning? Because it's, I have seven pieces in the attack. Two bishops, two knights, two rooks, and rooks is attacked to queen. He has some pieces protected, okay? Rook, two pawns, and bishop, and maybe queen. Okay, we can change, you know, it's, it's an, equal, an equal change. I change one attacking piece for one defensive piece, but I have enough pieces to make him. So there you see Kasparov's first thoughts. He first of all doesn't calculate this next move because he feels it on instinct, but he explains his justification. Now, some of you might have heard me say that you shouldn't sacrifice unless you have two more attacking pieces than they have defenders, and this is a perfect example. Gary plays knight takes h6. Now, that move cannot be, that knight cannot be taken with the pawn, but it can be taken with the rook. That's where everything begins. At the same time, we have other moves. Black can play. For example, black can jump maybe in the way, again, this idea, uh, or black can push the c-pawn. But Gary's whole point is that he's got two knights, queen, two bishops, and potentially both rooks involved in the attack, right? He's saying that all his pieces are going to get involved, including this one, which seems kind of insane right now. At least with the queen, it makes sense. But enough from me. Let's listen to what Gary has to say about this position. Namely, what happens after rook takes h6? Why didn't he take? Okay, if he takes here, it's very nice. I took knight takes d6. Now I can show you many good, interesting lines. Number one, if he's trying to escape with his queen, queen d7. Then I put queen g4. Means. If he takes here, then bishop takes g7, mate. So bishop takes? Bishop takes, queen takes. This is mate. Mate, yes. If he takes... If he takes your queen With the rook, wait, sir, with... Yes. Then check. And he cannot... Because of because check. check, and this is... It's pinned, the pawn is pinned. And the king g8 is a, is a mate in several moves. Bishop h7, bishop g6, and queen h7, mate. So the first thing that Gary shows here is what happens after rook takes h6, now he shows knight takes pawn. Essentially that first knight sacrifice gets the rook out of the way, and so this knight can move with an attack on the queen. Now two things attack the queen, so he says what about queen to d7? And here Gary shows this very nice move. It's not a follow-up of some sort of deathly shot, it's actually the offering of a queen trade. What? What do you mean you're gonna offer a queen trade? I thought you just sacrificed the knight. But more to come on that. But first things first, Gary says, what about queen takes knight? Then the queen stops guarding this, and the queen, the rook, and the bishop on b2 stockpile, and it's just mate in a few moves, takes, and this. But, but, what if you take like this? If you go back and take and reinforce your queen, well now, after queen g4, I sneak this way. I disallow your king from escaping, you can't block because you're not actually guarding because of the pin, and now we have king g8, bishop drops in, king to h8, and now you cut the king's escape, and you disconnect the rook, and this is checkmate. But we have only looked at taking that knight, and we've only looked at this, and then followed with queen g4. Let's see what else there is, like for example, after queen takes queen. If he takes my queen, then it's a very nice combination. Check. The only move. Check. Check. King of seven. Bishop g6. Check. King g8. The only moves. Bishop of five. Bishop e6. King g8. Bishop takes e5. Check. And bishop takes b7. And so you, you have a nice investment which is a rook up. If Karpov takes the queen, Gary says there's a nice combination. First of all, you don't take back. The knight jumps into f7. And now it's a sequence of only moves. King to g8 because one bishop cuts. Now you take like this. Black goes here. You take, it's check, and the king cannot go to the corner because of those bishops. So we have king to f7. 
We have bishop to g6. The king cannot go to the e-file because of the rook. King to g8. Now we drop back here, bringing the king back. So we use a little boomerang technique to go here. Now the king can go to the e-file because the rook is blocked. But now we take, it's discovered check, the king moves, bishop takes, and at the end of a massive sequence of moves, white is a rook up, which they call a nice investment. But, ladies and gentlemen, this stuff doesn't even have to happen. There are far more layers to the move knight takes d6, and that's why Gary says it's not the end of the story. So Gary, tell us what is the end of the story. In this position, he could go to an h5. Here I play rook g5. You cannot take here because knight f7 check and take the queen. If you take here, it's interesting, you know. Knight check. Check, check king h8. Rook takes d1 and c3. And it looks very good for black because it's now the pawn is closed. Bishop is hanging, c2 is threatening. But suddenly, knight f7 check, king g8, bishop g6, c takes b2, rook h5. And, and there is no defense. <laughs> So this next sequence of moves is truly absolutely legendary. Gary says he didn't even spot this next part at the board, but he saw it after. So, Gary said, what about queen h5? Right? Trying to trade queens with me. And here is just an absolutely beautiful move. Rook g5. Now, Gary says it so nonchalantly that if you just watch that video, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I don't you know. No, look at rook g5. Appreciate this move. That is just a free rook. But you can't take it because you get a family fork. It deflects the queen just the right way. So then Gary shows this. What if queen takes queen? Now this is probably, if you made it this far in the video, I love you and it's going to be worth it. Thank you so much. You're about to witness something absolutely beautiful. It belongs in a museum. Knight to f7 anyway. King to g8 because again you can't go here. Knight takes rook you can't take because you're pinned and king goes back. And now you take the queen. And we have this moment where black would like to play this move, but can't because of the bishop. So black plays the move c3, which looks great because now you've blocked the bishop and now you're just going to win something. But here is something so gorgeous. The knight goes back, the king moves over, and you create a tomb. And black cannot prevent rook h5, rook h8, cb2, rook h5, rook h8. And it, that is why Gary smiles. An absolutely beautiful entombment of the king on g8. Now, one small detail. Black doesn't have to do this. Black could theoretically go back and prevent rook h5. But then you would take. And now white just has an overwhelming advantage and is just completely winning. But of course, c takes b2 with this whole idea. Just this whole idea of finding this is, is I mean, it's just beautiful. So I wanted to translate this part. Let's keep going. And uh, final, final, I can show you the final. If he sacrificed queen, I mean, just in this position. If he sacrificed queen by playing queen takes e1, queen takes e1, rook takes d6. Then I played queen e4, threatening mate, knight d3, queen h4 check, king g8, bishop takes g7, bishop takes g7, and queen g4. Now for this last calculation, Gary says, well, what if Karpov realizes that all the other stuff doesn't work and he just sacrifices his queen, takes and rook d6. If you actually look at this in your, it just on the board, black is up a point. If you count everybody up, black is up one point of material. But here, white has to find the move queen to e4, lining up the queen with the bishop to go to h7. There's very few ways to stop this. If you play knight back to f6, you open up this, and then you're going to lose the entire house on the queen side. So in this position, black might play knight to d3, which is an interposing defense. But now white has queen to h4 check, king g8 only move, and you just bulldoze the house with this beautiful bishop sacrifice. Why? Because after bishop takes queen g4, black has all these pieces, but not a single piece can protect the bishop on g7, from the queen and the rook battery on the g file rook d7 is the only way and the queen takes an absolutely beautiful geometric sequence and as hikaru would say it's the classic right triangle it was just come try to to close this bishop you know it's fine but now this bishop is very strong so, so first of all you gave one piece now you're sacrificing another piece yeah, another piece okay he killed this bishop but this bishop now he cannot close it anymore and he gave you some strong. tempi, which is tempi, important yes. in chess. Yes, absolutely. And I have, okay, I still have six pieces. 
So okay. si seven, uh, <coughs> six instead of seven, this is not a big, big loss. But no, there's no opponent. No? But one defender less, as you said yes. before. So instead of five, now four defenders. Yes, and it's not enough. I keep with bishop c8 trying to... To have some play. Queen h4 check. If he goes king g8 and simple king h2 and no defense, knight g5. Knight g5 and then queen h7. And mate. Yes. Mate. So for this last part, Gary moves to the actual moves in the game. Karpov played the move c3. Karpov's idea was to disconnect the dark squared bishop from the attack entirely, and Kasparov backs the knight up to f5, and we have c takes b2. And here the interviewer says, well, you sacrificed one piece and now another. It's not quite the this, this story, because Gary offered the knight for sacrifice, it wasn't taken, and now he backed up, and you would think, well, he lost a very powerful long-range piece, and this pawn's so close to promotion. But as Gary said, by making this c-pawn move, you are never closing my bishop. Remember that knight jump in the way of the light squared bishop? It was supported by the c-pawn. Now this bishop is alive forever. And here, Gary just kind of says, well, you know, the idea is that after queen to g4 out, act, by the way, only move, only move, activating the queen and trying to get over here, um, black has to be very careful because the threat is just to go king h2 with knight to g5. Um, and what that means is, for example, bishop c8, which is what got played in the game to try to come here, check, and now if king to g8, Kasparov would play this move. Why? Because if he just goes here, this is with check. So Kasparov, in a very, very just calm way, would have played king to h2, and in the belligerent attack that he is launching on his opponent, he makes one king move, and black has nothing to stop. Knight g5 and queen to h7 mate. h6. Take, take, king h2. Very and strong move. An important move, you know. Just now my knight can go because rook is, is hanging without check. Queen e5, knight g5, king f6, queen f6, rook e8. Now I have five, only five pieces in attack, but you know, just three defenders left. And so, my friends, we are now nearing the end of the game. Since king to g8 would lead to this and this with mate, Karpov plays rook to h6. Now, obviously, uh, Kasparov takes it. And here we have g takes h6, and we have the move king to h2. Gary says, I played the move king h2 because now I can move my knight, and it will not be check. My rook is unguarded, but the queen departing will be devastating to the position uh, of, the, of, of the black king, and as long as it doesn't come with check, I'm good. Again, we see a calm, prophylactic move. Karpov plays queen to e5, Gary plays knight g5, right, hitting this, and if the queen were to take this rook for free, knight to f7 is literally checkmate. It's an attack, and every square is covered from a distance, right? So Karpov plays queen back to f6, and Gary plays rook e8. And before we cut out from the video, he says, there are three defenders remaining. This knight is lurking, but it's not defending, and one, two, three, four, five versus three, is significantly more dangerous for the person with three than when it was 7-5. Seven, 7-5 five. Seven, five is not the same as 5-3. You're slowly losing all guards of your king. Your king is running out of room. Let's see how Gary finishes it off. Yeah, but 5-3 is, is much more dangerous than 7-5. Than <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, for instance, any move, if you will, bishop b7 here, then it says I have the same combination, but mate. Immediately. Immediately. He made the only move just to avoid the mate. Uh, in, in three, but anyway, it's here I, I play this very nice move. Queen takes h6. This you know? is fantastic because in a world championship, it is it's very unusual to have queen sacrifices. Yes, queen sacrifices. yes this is true. Queen takes h6, knight f7 check, queen g6, and here it's an un, unforgivable mistake. You know, you should yes. take with zero. Yeah, I know, but. So essentially, after Gary infiltrates with the rook, there is a very beautiful threat. And he shows it by showing bishop b7. There is a beautiful queen sacrifice. The point is that the rook is pinning the bishop to the king, so the only move is this, deflecting from the defense of f7, and knight f7 would come with checkmate, which is what we saw earlier. And now we see the value of this bishop on b1. But Karpov played bishop to f5, which, which uh, in interferes with the bishop's control of h7. Now here, Gary still uncorks the same queen sacrifice, because why the hell not? But it's funny, because the computer here gives a much more savage evaluation. 
it wants you to play knight f7, and apparently it's a forced mate in six. But if you can sacrifice a queen and still win, you should. Knight f7, and now bishop takes f5 comes with check. There are no moves for the king, but the queen can block. <laughs> it's pretty funny because here, Gary says that he made an unforgivable mistake. And it's because he took with the bishop. And you would say, well, how does that make any sense? I mean, he just followed a natural follow-up. Because apparently, if Gary had played rook g6, it's not a check, but any rook move is mate. So, for example, let's say, like, knight c2, just go back, and it's mate. And it just, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter even if you come and, and attack the rook. It's going to be mate in a few moves, because you will just go back, this, and you will just do the same thing. You're just gonna move out of the way. It doesn't. Your rook is hanging. It doesn't matter. But Gary, you know, wanted to be thorough, wanted to be forcing, and for that reason, he took on g6 uh, with the bishop. We got this, and let's not forget there was a rook hanging. And again, there's no promotion. So Gary plays rook takes, bishop to e7, rook b8, a5, bishop e4 check, and he takes because after knight takes, he would come back. And Gary Kasparov would have had two rooks and two extra pawns versus knight and bishop. And very soon he will pick up the rest of the pawns. So it was after bishop takes d5 check on move 41 that Karpov resigned. And uh, here are the final seconds of that game. And Karpov concedes. What an incredible game by Gary Kasparov. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, our deep dive of game 20 in the 1990 World Championship match between Gary Kasparov and Anatoly Karpov has come to an end. Shout out once again to GJ Chess for allowing me to use some of the video footage. And if you enjoyed this and you want me to do this for other videos that might be on YouTube or other footage of games, do let me know in the comments below. As always, I do enjoy reading them and I will happily take many of your suggestions. As always, if you're new, welcome. And if you're returning, welcome back. Got tons of playlists for you to enjoy on openings, middle games, end games, puzzle solving, guess the ELO, you name it. I will see you in the next video.